Hello, hello. I'm Savannah. And I'm Alicia. And this is Burden of Proof. Welcome back to another week. Another day, another, another dollar. True crime story. We don't have a set intro after this. I don't think we have any business. I don't think so. I think we're good. I think we're good. We're cool. in the middle of the month. Yep. This is uh, close to my birthday, so that's... Yeah, your birthday's coming up. Yep. April baby. April baby. I'm going to be 22. Which Just a baby. It's crazy. Yeah. So I think we can jump right into the case. I hope you guys enjoyed last week as much as I did. Alicia did a great yeah. job. Um, but this week is not going to be so fun. Oh, no. Sorry. Much less drama in this one. More gore. More gore. It's not like gore report levels of gore. Gotcha. But it's more than I normally bring, I think. Okay. And I I, th- I tried to tamper it a little because it just, it, you know, this one struck my heart a little. Okay. All right. So let's set the scene. <laughs> Wayne and Garth. Yep. Two o'clock in the morning, officers are dispatched to a lake body of water. I forgot to clarify what kind of water it was. I think it was a lake. Okay. <laughs> some sort of. We're off to a good start. Yeah. Some, some sort of. <laughs> Body of water. A body of water. <laughs> Some sort of body of water. I'm like 90% sure it was like a lake. Okay. I mean, what other options are there? It wasn't a pond. And it wasn't an ocean. So it's a lake. A canal? No. <laughs> it's in the middle of Colorado. Uh, it's a lake. It's a lake. It's a lake. A stream? A waterfall? No, it's like a... It's, <laughs> it's a lake. <laughs> she just keeps putting her arms out. <laughs> it's a circle. It's a lake. <laughs> It's a lake. Are you hugging a tree? I don't know. I just, yeah. there's so many different types of water <laughs> <laughs> that I always get worried I'm going to call it the wrong thing. I don't know. Chances are it's a lake in Colorado. Got it's it. It's a lake. It's a lake. Officers are dispatched to a lake at two o'clock in the morning for a vehicle that was submerged into the water. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure what most people think when they get that kind of call, but it's not really what they thought it was going to be. They show up and there is a sedan submerged in the water. Um, Terry, Brian Cohey Sr. and Brian Cohey Jr. are all there. And Brian Cohey Jr. is warming up in his father's car. I'm just going to call him Brian and then I will call Brian Sr. Brian Sr. Okay, cool. Terry tells the police officers that her 19-year-old son, Brian, um, had gone out for a night drive and gone to the boat ramp. Boats. Lake. It's a lake. Can't take a boat on a pond. I mean, technically you can, (laughs) but (laughs) it might not go very far. It's It's not a lot of room. It's a lake. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, He had gone for a night drive and stopped at the boat ramp. He was familiar with the boat ramp because his father was in charge of the life jacket program there. And Terry tells the story of her son parking his car on the ramp, which was muddy and wet. Mm -hmm. Um, And when he got back in his, he like walked, he got out, walked around, looked at the stars and he got back into his car when he tried to move it out. Unfortunately, he lost control and then had to fight to get out of the vehicle as the lake took its new whip. (laughs) The lake wanted a new car. And nay, nay. Mm. Sorry. I don't know. Nope. Your arm gesture when I you said did. whip. <laughs> well, so the reason we call a car a whip is because this is the motion you make when you turn the steering yeah. wheel. Yeah. You whip but it. when you did that, it just made me think of the song. Well, right. Because that's kind of the joke. I mean, mm-hmm. you whip the car around. Whip it. Anyway, the car wanted its, uh, the lake wanted its new, its new whip. So like I said, he was in his father's car and the officer comes to talk to him through the window. He repeats the same story, joking with officers that he was probably out $7,000, but other than that, he was all right. He wasn't hurt, and while it was inconvenient, it was fine. There was no accident. So Brian is released to go home and warm up and get clean because he had gone into the water with the car to get out in the lake. So I'm assuming that he took his mom's car because it looked like 
that he was in his dad's car kind of thing. And his parents were I'm not sure if they were divorced or separated, but I'm pretty sure they were divorced. They weren't together. That's for sure. <laughs> not like okay. in a negative way. I just know that they, like there were several times where Brian mentioned his mom's house or his dad's house. Gotcha. But they were very amicable. I didn't know for sure if they were divorced or not because of the way that they're very respectful towards each other. And yeah, so we'll see that throughout the whole story. Basically, the officers are like, yeah, we'll um, get your insurance information for the accident report in the morning. But other than that, like you can go home and go to bed. And his parents stayed to try and find a tow company that would be able to get the car out. And after trying to do this back and forth for a little while, um, the officers convinced them, like, let's just reconvene in the morning because it's like at this point three or four in the morning. Yeah. They're like, let's do it when it's bright outside. Terry had climbed into Brian Sr.'s vehicle when an officer comes back up to the window and he says that he saw something strange when he was examining the back half of the drowned car. He asks Terry one more time if her son was hurt because they think they saw blood on the trunk of the car. They're basically like, I I wonder if maybe because of adrenaline you didn't feel it, you would cut yourself on something. Like, it was an older vehicle. There could have been, like, a jagged spot in the paint or you were cut, like, by the pipe trying to climb out of the lake or something. Like, are you sure you're not hurt and just can't feel it? And he has absolutely no idea where the blood came from. He's like, nope, I'm fine. I just took a shower. Like, I'm, I'm fine. There's no, there's nothing on me. He seems genuinely shocked at the sight of blood on his car. And so the group is like, maybe it's not blood. It's kind of far out. It's dark. It's hard to tell. Like, it, it could just be something else. Like, it's probably not blood, obviously. He's fine. Yeah. And while the story seems slightly unstatistically likely, It also doesn't seem like a lie. Like, (laughs) in their heads, why would this 19-year-old kid who, from what they can tell, seems like a very normal guy, his parents aren't mad at him, nobody's upset, they're all just like, this is an accident, this sucks. Like, why would they think that he's, there's anything to be concerned about? Yeah, right away, sure. Right. So they leave the car for the night. Brian Cokey Jr., though, we will find, is a bit of an oddball. All of my sources and facts are linked below, but I like to mention one by name, um, the Explore With Us YouTube channel and their documentary, which is titled Parents Discover Teen Son Horrifying Secret. It's about two hours long, and it's entirely made up of broken down body cam police station footage and witness testimony. It was excellent. Wow. Um, It was a really good way to immerse myself in the case. And so if you'd like to see any of the footage that we talk about, highly recommend that it was definitely in that documentary is where I saw it. So. Gotcha. When Brian Jr. was five years old, he was diagnosed with ADHD, and this would be the first of many mental health disorders that he would struggle with throughout his life. His ADHD has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the episode, but I bring it up so that you can see that people were watching his behavior from a young age. Yeah. His mother ran a daycare out of her home. He had a younger brother, and he struggled with being bullied in elementary school, but eventually he found some friends. He was a part of a group of kids who were all wallflowers, and they just kept picking up social rejects along the way, as a lot of friend groups are. As he got a little bit older, he was diagnosed with Asperger's, which I actually believe is now part of just ASD, which is just the autism spectrum disorder. But at the time, it was Asperger's. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even at this age, he was starting to be known by teachers and his peers to be a very disarming person um he just regularly do things to get a rise out of his classmates such as saying racial slurs in class making inappropriate jokes just overall a little troublemaker but it was middle school where he really started to show his antisocial behavior His teachers were very aware of the issues, and throughout his entire academic career, his parents met with staff, counselors, teachers, and therapists to try and keep Brian on the right track. Ninth grade was okay, but 10th and 11th grade, he got into a lot of trouble, and in 11th grade, he had a big staff meeting, well, his parents had a big meeting with all of his teachers and the admin of the school where they came to Brian's parents and said, hey, the kids don't feel safe. Mm. Like, this isn't good. I can relate to this because Brian and I are the same age. (laughs) So he was in 11th grade when I was in 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that when I was in 11th grade, 
I told my teachers on somebody that made me feel unsafe in school, like Mm -hmm. school shooter level situations. Like that's the climate that we were living in and still are living in. You know, I I refer to it as the school shooter era. It's still happening. It's not an era, but I just this, you know, time frame in our history is so volatile in schools that I can just imagine the conversation that they had. Well, and just for my own personal experience with kids, Mm -hmm. I mean, because, of course, you know, I graduated right before Columbine. So life was so different Mm pre-Columbine. But as much as people think or like there's this narrative that, oh, schools overreact to everything and they... No, actually, Mm -hmm. they don't like because there's so much stuff being reported Mm -hmm. and kids are struggling so much. I can't speak for all school districts or all whatever, but I can tell you I've had struggles of schools not telling me about what is happening with my child at a school when they were having trouble. Yeah, they weren't. They were having trouble like being bullied, but they were also doing something wrong. And I knew something was going on with my kid, but I did not know what. And the school, like, would not be honest with me about it. It was really, you know, they say it takes a village and it does. But in this day and age, schools actually, like, they may deal with it at school. They often don't always tell the parents the whole story because so many parents are quick to be like, not my baby. So for them to call in Mm -hmm. everybody and say, listen kids are feeling unsafe like right. that's a wide spread problem yeah and they i mean his record showed that they had had issues with him his entire academic career yeah um and we're going to talk about some of those examples in just a minute um but after this meeting they his parents had him reevaluated where they took him back to a psychiatrist and i mean he was regularly in therapy and stuff but they took him to somebody else to get a second opinion and he was re-diagnosed with ADHD and autism, but the doctors told him, told the parents that they should really get him evaluated for psychosis and for some sort of psychiatric yeah. issue. Brian would later say that the doctor told him he had schizo something. He wasn't sure which kind of disorder he would have, but mm-hmm. that it was something in that realm. Um, and But they hadn't gotten to that point in his treatment to get him evaluated by this point. Gotcha. Okay. So he was still acting out, um, and here's some examples of things that he would do in school. One of his teachers, as a witness, I'm not sure if it was in trial or to a, a reporter or something like that, but she told a story about how she always wanted her students to have, like, attention grabbers when they did speeches and presentations. hmm So Brian had a history speech, and he made, like, a whip or a mace situation out of masking tape to be his like attention grabber and he hit it on the podium to like get his attention and he got a good grade on that and whatever and that would be fine it's quite creative and everything except for later in the day when he beat a disabled student with it oh so that happened that's not what they mean brian no he also knew a girl in his school um, struggled with PTSD, and he knew that loud noises triggered panic attacks for her. So he went up behind her and clapped in her ear and yelled, and it did, in fact, trigger a panic attack. And this girl had to, like, take some time off from school, and it was horrible. And they reported this to his parents, and they knew that this stuff was happening, and they were doing what they could. There's only so much parents can do. Yeah. there's Especially at that age. Mm-hmm. Because he was in high school. You're like 16 or 17 in 11th grade. So they're almost grown. They're almost 18. For me, this is possibly the hardest era of parenting. Mm -hmm. I hate it. (laughs) I hate it. I'm not going to lie. I hate it. And I say that like my kids know that I love them, but they and they know that like I was always terrified. The only reason that I thought I might not want to have kids was because of this era. Because I'm like, you're you're basically an adult, but you're not. Right. You're walking around in this adult body and able to do adult things, but your mind isn't even fully yeah. <laughs> like developed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That frontal cortex is not fully developed. Yeah. 
So it's the hardest as a parent because you're supposed to be letting go and giving them freedoms. But at the same time, when you have a kid that's struggling with something, what do you do? What do you do? I don't know. I feel for his parents. Yeah, especially because um, he also gets diagnosed with major depressive disorder. Yep. And his, his grades suffered, but he was able to graduate high school. He started working at Safeway part time and he was able to hold that job down for quite a quite a while. He was active on social media. He regularly posted social like self-deprecating comments and posts and things like that. He was always alarmingly interested in the morbid, um, and his mother thought that she could help him channel this into a career path, encouraging him to read about crime scene investigation and other forms of forensic study. Mm, I get that, but mm, that's a risk. (laughs) That's a risk. Yep. Yep. And And since we're here, I'm guessing. Yeah, it didn't go great. It didn't go the way she expected. But I think that, like, that was a good thing for her to try, like. No, that's what I mean. I get it. Like, I get why she would think that. It's, I think the line is like, are you interested from a scientific standpoint? Or mm-hmm. are you interested from a creep standpoint? Yes. Um, And I think it goes without saying that Brian preferred a dark form of media or entertainment. He was constantly reading books about serial killers. Sorry, we do that too. And his mom noted that over the summer, he watched Silence of the Lambs like over and over again. Hmm. And he also really liked this one movie about the Zodiac Killer. I don't know. And they just assumed that he just liked dark stuff. I mean, yeah, they were obviously and very clearly concerned about his behavior. But yes. at the same time, he could just be somebody who likes. There are plenty of yeah. us who like the morbid. But yeah. like you said, just a fascination or the scientific aspect or the legal aspect or what a, or psychology. But that doesn't mean right. we're looking to actually Mm -hmm. be the subject of a true crime right story so yeah they were encouraging him to use his strange passions to try and make a life for himself a few months prior to brian's car being found in the lake his parents discovered a backpack containing some alarming items including zip ties a hammer and some duct tape they demanded that he disassemble this and get rid of it and they were very upset they were like this is like brian bro what the what the hell yeah that's a pretty good indicator that you're not interested in this for giggles right and so they were trying i mean and like what do you do (laughs) so and he did he he did he listened to his parents he whatever the consequence they told him was going to happen he was like i don't want to do that so he disassembled it he didn't have it anymore but there were other issues so that was like kind of later, closer to like 2019, 2020-ish. Um, like actually it's probably closer to 2021. I don't know. No. Something like in that whole range of time. I'm not sure when the kill kit situation occurred. Gotcha. Um, but in 2018, we are going to have a big trigger for animal cruelty here. I'm sorry. Um, mm-hmm. but unfortunately it's a tough one and it's not something that we can just gloss over, so it's gonna be kind of graphic. Yeah. So in 2018, Brian herded a stray black cat into a sleeping bag before beating it to death. He decapitated it and put its head in a wine box and the rest of its body in a shoe box. He kept the body until he was forced to get rid of it because of the smell. So the Kohi family lived in Grand Junction, Colorado, and this had been a rumor floating around their community through his friends and his school that this had happened, that something that Brian had killed a cat and um, that he was starting to show signs of, you know, serial killer situation. Mm-hmm. Um, but his friends didn't really want to believe this. They just thought it was like something that even maybe Brian had started this rumor because he's just like dark like that. Like he would have thought that was hilarious. So they didn't really believe that it was true. And Brian didn't really do anything to dispel the rumors, but he didn't like confirm it either. Right. Throughout all his research with his favorite serial killers, everyone seemed to say that killing was the best feeling in the world. Not only that, he, but he had a curiosity for an, for anatomy, uh, but in a very creepy killer way. He had escalated from bullying and behavior issues to slaughtering a neighborhood cat, and now he had decided that he wanted to take the next step into darkness. For about 6 to 12 months before the crime, Brian started looking for a victim. He said himself that he was looking for a prostitute or a homeless person, someone that the police would be less likely to investigate. 
In fact, his original plan was to find a prostitute, take her off somewhere, and torture her to death. But he says to investigators later that there are no prostitutes in Grand Junction. The officer actually indicates that there are prostitutes in Grand Junction, and I can't help but be happy for those girls that he never found them. Wow. In late February, Brian goes out for a drive. He knew his goal, and he knew it so well that he dressed for the occasion. He was wearing his Mike Myers costume from the 4th of July. From the 4th of July. <laughs> from Halloween. <laughs> from Halloween. Yes. Um, That's like last week when I said Robert instead of Ed. <laughs> Who, yeah. What? What? Who's Robert? Who's Robert? Um, he wore his Mike Myers costume, um, minus the mask from Halloween, because he said he associated that outfit with violence. He knew exactly what he wanted, but he hadn't found his victim yet. And as he was driving underneath a bridge, he passes a canvas pile on the ground, and he instantly recognizes it as a homeless man. This is going to get a little bit rough. Brian puts on three sets of latex gloves, and he's wearing a mask of some sort. I don't think it was the Mike Myers mask. I feel like I definitely would have known if it was the Mike Myers mask, but he did say a mask, okay? <laughs> they have, like, Michael Myers mask and then, like, a COVID mask over, COVID mask over <laughs> top. There's a picture no, wait, of... this is pre-COVID, isn't it? Um, It's, yeah, we're coming up on COVID. It's February, gotcha. and COVID would begin in, like, March. Because <laughs> they pretty gotcha. sure it's 2020. Like that time frame we're coming mm-hmm. up on it there's a picture of the mike myers mask in like all the crime scene photos because it's in his bedroom so there is some people who say that he was wearing but he wasn't i'm like 90 percent sure he was not wearing this freaking mike myers mask okay I, in my head he's not because if he was i couldn't sleep that's the reality i mean who knows no he wasn't <laughs> i've decided we'll let savannah believe that <laughs> No. He pulls back the blankets covering the man and he stabs him multiple times, having a brief yet terrifying conversation in which the man asks him why he's doing this. During the interrogation, Brian seems really fixated on this final gasp that his victim gave. He had stabbed him so many times in the neck that he was almost decapitated, but Brian was not satisfied with murder. Cut open the man's entire torso, examining his bowel and his organs. He dismembered and finalized the decapitation, breaking apart bones and spreading the crime scene far over the underpass. He read in his crime scene research that crime scenes are typically searched in a 10 to 15 foot circumference and he wanted his to be wider. He took large and vital pieces with him, the torso, hands, and the man's head. He loaded them into his car and drove away. Interestingly enough, he put the victim's head in a pizza box to transport it. Um, This, like... How do you Freak. put a head in a pizza it's box? It's just like covered. Like, okay. It wasn't like the box wasn't closed. It was just like so that if somebody gotcha. was to look in his car. Yeah. Okay. This really freaked me out, not only because it's like a horrific thing in, in and of itself, but also because he had put the cat's head in a box as well. Mm-hmm. And so we're seeing a pattern that we're. Uh, What's in the box, Brian? (laughs) We're lucky that he didn't get a chance to repeat this because this is clearly uh, an M.O. of his. Yeah. He probably watched that movie, too. And saw he just wanted to relive Brad Pitt screaming, what's in the box? What's in the box? He was off to the boat ramp. Yeah, of course. So he threw some things in the lake, including a large portion of the victim's body, um, but fortunately for us, he was dumb and his car slid into the water. He had taken a trip home first. Let me clarify. He didn't go directly to the lake. He took yeah. some things home first and he like changed clothes and ran laundry a couple times. And then he went to the boat ramp. Wow. That's ballsy. Yeah. So then the whole boat ramp thing happened and the police came and they, you know, and his family took him home and. Bada bing, bada boom. Once the vehicle was towed home, Brian Sr. began looking at the interior of the car, trying to go through the contents and what was inside to see what was salvageable. Right. In between the seats, he found a frozen wallet, and he knew it was neither of his sons, like when he first opened it. Inside, he found a social security card, a driver's license, and information on a, I, I believe it was a ground construction crew, but like some sort of work information 
for a man named Warren Barnes. He got in touch with Brian and he says, hey, Brian, who is Warren? Why is his wallet frozen in your car? And he said he didn't know him, but he had found it when he had gone down to the boat ramp that night Mm -hmm. and he had just picked it up and put it in his car. So his dad calls the company that's on the information in the wallet and he asks, hey, do you guys have a warrant? And they said, yes, we do. And actually, we haven't been able to get a hold of him today, but yeah, like, yeah, we know who he is. He works for us. And so he says, hey, here's my information. When you see him, let him know I have his wallet. We'll get together and we'll get it. We'll get it back to him. Mm -hmm. But the construction company was not the only person who hadn't heard from Warren. While Warren was homeless, he was very reliable. He'd been working with that crew for years, and he had never missed a day of work. He was also a regular out front of a bridal store downtown, where the owner regularly left him books to read, gave him cash, drinks, a meal, and held conversation. He watched out for her, and she watched out for him. He was a staple of their community downtown, and when the bridal store owner didn't see him that day, she called his work. Now, at work, he would always come in bright and early for coffee or breakfast, and they thought it was strange that he hadn't shown up at all, because even if he was sick or, like, couldn't work for some reason, he would definitely show up for at least that portion of his day. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, they hadn't heard from him at all, and so when the bridal store owner calls, they say, no, but somebody did find his wallet down by the boat ramp. She was like, that's too far away from his normal routine or his routes or anything like that. That's too far. So she called the police and met them down at the boat ramp. She told them that she had a really horrible feeling about everything that was going on. And while the police are looking for Warren, the Kohi parents are still looking through their son's things. In the glove box of the car, Brian's father finds a knife. Now, he knew his son had the knife, but he thought it was in his room. Uh, Brian felt like he needed it for protection or something. Like, I don't know. He was a weird kid. You never know when you need to protect yourself against homeless sleeping people. Yeah, that you go up to. They just thought he was paranoid or something. And so Brian Sr. leaves. He's like, this is weird, but I have to go pick up my son from school. And Brian Jr. takes one of the other cars to his friend Kylan's house. And he's at his mom's when this is happening. So he takes one of the, the cars at his mom's house, which I believe was like, Either a spare or his brother's car, but his brother just had his learner's permit, so it was just kind of like the the extra. Mm -hmm. It was an older Mustang, and he took it over to his friend's house. Terry, like I said, ran a daycare out of her home, and she had a few kids staying at her house at the time, but she was able to, like, tidy and clean some stuff up, you know? And I'm sorry. I I looked glazed over because I just... You had said that earlier, but it didn't, like, register until just now. That, like, my God, can you imagine how the parents of her in-home daycare felt? I give right. you my kids every day and your son. Right. Well, well, it's yeah. like the, oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Well, like I said, she's tidying up and she goes into her son's room um, and she finds a large Rubbermaid tub in his closet. Like, she, I'm assuming she was just going in, like, grabbing laundry or something. She never, she never really says why she was in there, but, like, she's a mom. She's just cleaning. But we all know what Rubbermaid tubs mean in this business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> inside, she found two large plastic bags, and she couldn't really see what was on the inside because it looked like it was double bagged, like, whatever it was. But she could tell that it had, like, bugs on it or something. She's mm-hmm. like, it's just, like, it just doesn't look right. Mm-hmm. So she's like, uh, what is Brian hiding in here? Like, she probably thought it was, like, food or something that had been left. Or I don't know what she thought. But either way, she's like, I'm going to take this to the sink because this just feels gross. So she takes it to the kitchen sink. And when she starts to open the bag, she is horrified to see a human ear. Mm. She quickly closes the bag and immediately calls Brian Sr. So she calls him and she's like, you got to get here now. Like, you need to be here immediately. And he's like, well, I'm picking up, you know, I'm picking up our son from school. And she says, get here. I don't care if you leave him. Like, get here now. So luckily, he was able to get his son and, and go to the home. In the meantime, while he was on his way, she called all of her daycare parents and said, there's been a family emergency. Your kids are all safe, but you need to come and pick them up. Yeah. So they come and they, the kids are taken away. And when Brian Sr. gets home, he kind of takes a glimpse at what Terry has seen. 
confirms it and covers both bags with a towel in the sink mm-hmm. to try and kind of keep from further traumatizing their family as much as possible. They come up with a really quick plan. They told Brian that they needed the car back because his brother needed to take a driving lesson because, like I mentioned, he has his learner's permit. And while he was driving home from his friend's house, they would call the police, and that way Brian would be at their home when the police got there. Mm -hmm. And so this is the 911 call that Terry made. 911, is John with the address emergency? Hi, there is an emergency. I found... I found something in my son's closet wrapped in a plastic bag. Okay, what was it? I think it's a human head. It's a what? I think it's a human head. Why do you think it's that? Because it looks like it. It's all an ear. Is it all, is it bloody or is it like anything like that? Can you just come? Do I have to take a picture and send it to you? What's the address? Is your son there now? He just pulled up. We wanted to make sure he was here before we called. How old is he? 19. He's had a little bit of a fascination with the morbid, but he was channeling it, I thought, into becoming a crime scene investigator, but not so much. Do you think he's going to be cooperative with us? I don't know. I don't think he'll be violent. Okay. Just came back from his son's house. Does he have any weapons in his room, or do you guys have any in the house? I don't know. I think that he has a shotgun, but we can certainly remove it immediately before he gets in his room. He's out by the car now, so. Is the bag still in the closet? No, it's in my kitchen sink. And there's a secondary bag that I have not opened. It's currently covered with a towel. And there's a it's second bag? Taking, yeah, there's a second bag. Though. I don't know what's in it. I didn't open it. I'm sorry. Did he take the, he took the second bag out of the closet? I took the second bag out of the closet and put it in the sink. Where's Brian now? I think he's still outside. And you're in the backyard now? I am, yes, because I don't want him to hear me. So that was... It March was of 2021. I was wrong. It was so he might have been wearing Michael Myers and then the COVID mask. <laughs> he might have just been wearing a COVID mask. <laughs> the reason I was confused is because I know that his trial gets delayed because of COVID. So I assumed yeah. that it, but I was just wrong by the year. But anyway, so you know, he's like, I'm gonna dismember you, but I won't give you COVID. In no the meantime. COVID in the meantime. How thoughtful. That is horrific. I feel of course horrible for Warren but you know it's been a while since we've talked about what the family members of mm-hmm. the criminals go through especially yeah. like especially in cases like this where the criminal is young and like your parent like he's yeah. young enough that the parents still feel like parents like a sense of responsibility over this yeah, and-, and he lived at home and that's awful yeah, it's it's tough and and they they talk about it a little bit more um later and we'll really get into the the effects of Brian's actions on his family. But yeah, I I just and both his parents talk in the in you know to the police and in interrogation rooms and you can see you can watch them process everything in real time. Mm. And it's just so hard to watch because she just keeps referring to him she's like oh my gosh this poor man like this poor this poor guy and my son did this and he, it, like she's taking responsibility for it it's it's so hard yeah. to watch but i will say they acted pretty smart in their plan because it worked um when the police arrived brian was home and so here is a clip from some body cam footage what's going on man how much Cooperate. I am going to cooperate. Okay. So, parents have some concerns of some stuff they may have found in your room? Um, yeah, I believe so. And what, what would it be? A human head and hands. Do you have anything on you he's going to cut, poke, hurts, stick me anything without reaching for nothing? Don't reach for nothing. My phone and my oh, wallet. That's okay. it. Well, I'm going to have you face that way. Put your hands on top of your head for me real quick. I just want to make sure you know, interlace your fingers for me real quick, all right? Terrifying. So terrifying. The way he oh you can watch him decide that he's just gonna tell them yeah and then he just owns it like he just that shift Mm -hmm. and then he says it like almost prideful like he goes from sounding scared like kind of like uh-oh to like yep yeah and that um that pride attitude will continue for the next several hours 
he's he's very brazen and pretty calm with the officers throughout everything. Um, and a lot of this, so you know, could be contributed to to his Aspergers to the way that he generally handles situations. But it doesn't yeah. make it any less strange for us to experience, especially the context that we're you know talking with him in. You know, I don't want it to come off like we're being like he was so cold, but we understand that he was he had ASD. I'm not saying that. Yeah, but- no, I mean that's. To me, it's not I did not expect him to like be like, oh, no, I'm caught like and right. be over emotional like some neurotypical people would because they don't tend to process things in that way. But that was like different. That was very yeah. different. Yeah. You understand why I don't want him in a Mike Myers mask? <laughs> yes, <Okay>. I do. <laughs> All right. That's yeah. So the police do verify what's in the bags, um, and they take Brian to the police station. Again, he continues this attitude, and I'm not going to call it an interrogation. I'm going to call it his confession conversation, because that's really what it was. He didn't, they didn't have to push him at all. Um, he tells the police everything, even doing a demonstration and drawing maps for the officers. And despite the fact that they didn't have to push much to get him talking, they did a great job of making Brian feel comfortable, which encouraged him to keep talking. Mm-hmm. He said many things that would help in his conviction. While he talked about his mental health issues, he would also clearly talk about his planning and all things premeditation. He talks about his fascination with Ed Gein, Ed Kemper, and Gacy. He talks about mm. his planning process, his kits, his intentions to find and torture a prostitute. He talks freely about how he felt during the murder, expressing what, that while he thought it would be the best feeling in the world, he actually felt nothing during the crime, other than it was easier than expected. He clearly showed interest in how the anatomy, and he talked about how he identified organs, and he talked about how he had spread apart the crime scene and how much he knew about crime scene and forensics. And this is where I had in my notes to talk about how his parents, in their interviews with social workers and officers, they just processed everything, you know, and his mom tells them all about his struggles growing up and his diagnoses. And Brian's dad said, like, their entire lives were ruined by this. And I'm not, I mean, yeah. like, he and Brian shared a name. And, yeah, like, Brian Sr. was self employed. And, like, this was, I mean, it was obviously, it's just a devastating story. And Terry kept repeatedly talking about Warren and how horrible she felt and how horrible it was and this poor man. And she just she had so much empathy for him and she just was so upset. It was just horrible. It was so hard to watch. And these very normal parents were struggling with what their child had done. Warren Barnes was a kind, giving and hardworking man. He loved books. He was a friend to all around him. The people of Grand Junction came together and created a beautiful monument of a nice chair statue with with books, not at his murder site, but at the place that he truly loved outside of the bridal shop and next next to a bookstore. Despite what Brian Cohey wanted to believe, Warren was not less dead because he did not have a home. He had a community, a found family of his own, who immediately noticed that he was missing. Their quick love and his own idiocy are what got Brian caught before he could kill again. Killing Moore is what would have happened. His friends and teachers were not shocked to hear what he had done, but they were shocked that he had only killed one person. Wow. People that knew him in high school were really shocked that he had not committed some sort of terrorist act or, like, yeah. shot up a school or, some like, robbed a convenience store. They were, they were really surprised when it was a smaller, not smaller scale, that's horrible, but I just mean, like, one victim. Yeah. No, there's a much different mindset Mm -hmm. to each of those things. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of what they thought they were dealing with. They didn't think that they were dealing like it's just a different beast. Mm -hmm. His teachers were not shocked. They were horrified and they were disappointed in what the system could provide for Brian. But at the same Mm -hmm. time, they said they did everything that they could for him. And that the public school system is not equipped, nor is it the place that should be equipped to deal with this level of mental illness. It's just. Well, I'm trying really hard not to get on a soapbox about (laughs) mental health and how unfair it is. How if more people had access to mental health, proper mental health care, maybe 
stuff like this wouldn't end up happening as often because most families cannot afford to pay what it costs to get the proper yeah. kind of mental health care. Right. And I don't even know if that applies necessarily to Brian's situation, but I agree with you. Like he Well, but he was suffering from some kind of schizo psychosis or possibly right but he was in treatment for everything like they were getting him they were on a treatment path he was in a consistent therapy they were working towards getting him treatment for those things i'm not saying that that's specifically his situation i don't know his situation yeah that's why i i just don't i i don't know what kind of treatment he was getting but i do know that they were they were trying I'm, I'm not blaming not blaming the parents at all that's why i meant like i'm trying not to get on like too big of a soapbox but like i think that this is a one of those moments that i can't help but speak <laughs> out against the system as a whole like our country's mental health system and probably many other countries is jacked up yeah we just we do not really have this figured out because it's one of those things it's all that about money. I don't I don't know how much treatment it would take to have stopped this. Like I don't I well, don't know. You know? Yeah. I don't know. And and maybe it wouldn't have, but unfortunately, majority of people cannot afford the treatment from the specific professionals that they pro- that they may need. Yeah. And that's just a harsh reality about our country and our healthcare system. And it sucks. That's my soapbox. I'm sorry. But that sucks. Yeah. So I feel for his parents. I'm heartbroken for his parents because I'm sure that they were doing everything they knew or were advised to do for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that's what it seems to me. Like every everybody who said something to them, they were taking it seriously and doing what they could. Yeah. And I also will say, while I don't know a ton about his family's dynamics, like I said, this is a two-hour docu-series where we're just watching basically just straight eyewitness footage from body cams and from mm-hmm. cameras and that sort of thing. And every interaction that you see from the boat ramp incident the night before where it's the middle of the night and both of these parents have been dragged out of bed to come, you know, deal with this. Everybody was super respectful to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I don't have any gut feeling that there was anything in childhood that made this be this way. I think this is just the way that Brian was born. I think this is straight up a nature situation versus a nature you know Mm -hmm. versus a nurture like that yeah i mean that absolutely i will say that people on the spectrum are often sort of more easily traumatized than neurotypical people so i mean something that wouldn't be traumatizing to most of us can be traumatizing to them yeah fair but that doesn't mean that like his parents or anybody did anything wrong because right. there's no way of you knowing exactly what would ever trigger a right. trauma within a child right. on the spectrum or with underlying mental health conditions good point yeah but yeah like i said earlier it was it was tough for me to even tell if they were married or divorced like they still both use the last name kohi so i'm if I if they're not divorced, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure that there were several times where it was referred to as mom's house, dad's house kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But they were they were just very kind to one another. And yeah. Yeah. So Brian decided to plead not guilty by reason of insanity, which delayed his trial for a mental evaluation. And also the pandemic really slowed things down, even yeah. though, as we've discovered, we were in 2021 and not 2020, like I thought. Uh, but here we are. So jury selection was difficult and long. And while a lot of potential jurors were at lunch one day, the defense was arguing on whether or not to throw out the interrogator's interrogator loosely (laughs) interrogator's comments and where he told Kohi that he reminded him of a serial killer, specifically Ed Kemper. The defense was like, this is an unfair association. And the judge was like, "Okay, so those won't be involved. Sure. So that was one issue. They also decided that a calendar entry on his phone titled first on 11 p.m. on February 27th and 28th, the days of the crime, would would remain as evidence in the trial because Mm -hmm. prosecutors were like, um, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe circumstantial, but 
why else would he write first? Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. His trial had lots of witnesses, including his friends, parents, and an expert who testified to his, well, multiple experts who testified to his mental evaluation. Mm-hmm. One expert specializing in uh, NGRI cases, not guilty by reason of insanity cases, says that she, he, like, he could still have severe mental health issues but still be legally sane. Um, As always. Right. So one doctor conducted body cam or like analysis of the body cam footage and said that Kohi was not on any medication and had no signs of psychosis. Yeah. She said that he does not meet the legal standard of insanity during the time of the murder because he was not suffering from mental disorder at the time of the murder. Wow. Like at the time like not yeah. something sort of no specific. psychosis can come sort of like come and go depending right. on and stress levels and mm-hmm. all sorts of stuff so this was the prosecution's doctor the defense dismantled it basically they said like you conducted this evaluation less than a year after you're getting your phd and you were using a temporary permit you're not a specialist in neurodevelopmental disorders and Brian was only your fourth evaluation at the same time, so not super reliable. Yeah, that's not. Yep, and so that was that. We'll get into we'll get into the others, the other doctor, in a little bit. Another witness brought forward by the prosecution was a digital forensics expert who went over the timeline of Brian's digital footprints leading up to the crime. Early February, Brian Google searched for information about holding people at knife point. Um, how deadly a neck stab wound had to be, and where homeless people sleep in the winter. On February 27th, the night of the murder, Brian Googles shell gas stations, because at some point he had gone and filled up his gas tank with the knife in his pocket, like, after the crime. And at 11.06 p.m., Brian visits a URL for Organic Waste Disposal Service. Between 11.06 and 11.08, five pictures of the murder scene were taken and deleted. The photos were so graphic that the jury had to view them in contained rooms and folders. Oh, my gosh. On March 1st, Brian, the, the next day, Brian searches for how to wipe data from an Android phone. At 2.41 a.m., Brian searched for if a river washes away evidence. So maybe it was a river. Boats can go in rivers. I don't if know. If it's a big enough river, deep enough. Yeah. And depending on the boat. And just the picture, like the, the body cam footage looked like a lake. <laughs> I thought it was a lake. But if it was dark, yeah, it'd be mm. hard to see. It's hard to see. And some rivers are wide enough that it's... I don't know. It looked like a circle. It looked like a lake to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert. Maybe it was a bend in the river. Maybe. And finally, at 6.16 a.m., Brian searched for how long does it take a body to stink. And finally, the last witness that the prosecution had was a forensic pathologist who completed the autopsy for Warren. Dr. Daniel Lingamfelter said that Warren suffered from a fractured skull and brain damage caused by blunt force trauma from an object like a rock or a baseball bat while he was still alive. Which is different than what he said, but I'll let it slide. Whatever. The doctor said that Brian had been stabbed 26 times in the neck and head, three of those while he was still alive, but Barnes was already dead when he was decapitated, dismembered, and mutilated. The board-certified forensic pathologist said that out of 8,000 autop- more than 8,000 autopsies he's conducted, he had only encountered a case this extreme less than 1% in his, in his career. Lord, I would hope so. <laughs> I know. A second doctor was brought up by the other side, and she testified that she diagnosed Brian with autism, ADHD, and major depressive disorder. But Dr. Katrina Caton told prosecutors that Brian has a mild form of autism and has no intellectual disability. She sent a letter of concern. Like, this is his doctor, not like a new psychologist. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I should have clarified. She had sent a letter of concern to Brian's mom because Brian was idolizing famous, like, dictators like Hitler and Stalin and the Columbine shooters. Mm -hmm. And he had told the doctor, quote, I want to be famous and it doesn't matter for what. The clinical psychologist that they, the defense brought up actually diagnoses Brian with antisocial personality disorder instead of major depressive disorder. 
And this is because, like, what? This is confusing. How do they? Okay. Let me back this up. The first doctor that the prosecution brought up tried to say that she thought that he had antisocial personality disorder instead of major depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. The second doctor says, no, that's incorrect. He does have ADHD, autism, and major depressive disorder. The diagnosis was correct. And that was his no doctor that he had been seeing or that was no there's three doctors it's there's a who, lot of doctors. who is the second doctor like which side so are they the prosecution brought the doctor who said no he has antisocial antisocial personality yes. disorder then his regular doctor testified normal this is how i diagnosed him and this is the which letter was the anti anti or depressive yes disorder. major depressive disorder yes the third doctor gets on the stand and blatantly says that she disagrees with the first doctor and she says that the reason she disagrees and that she believes he does have major depressive disorder is because there was no evidence of a conduct disorder before 15 years old there was no theft property destruction or repetitive rule breaking that would indicate he had anti-personal anti-personality disorder anti-social personality disorder i know you know more about this than i do so yeah i'm not a professional though i mean right even though sometimes I probably sound like I'm trying to be, I swear I'm not. <laughs> um, I, I mean, he had problems in school, but we don't know how young that actually started. Oh, it started young and it, it just got, he really started to show signs in like late middle school. Yeah. But he wasn't committing super major crimes. Like his mom said in an interview that his, his behavior issues didn't really start until 14. Right. So that's what she's saying. She says there's no signs of anything prior to like early yeah. to late to mid adolescence. So that's what makes her believe that it's major depressive disorder. I don't know. You don't know, say? I don't know. Honestly, like to me, antisocial personality disorder makes perfect sense. But I, I don't know as far as like the nuances of you know right i don't know right so do you think i cleared up the doctors or sorry <laughs> there's too many doctors and none of them have first names <laughs> except for the one no i mean i understand now that you broke it down okay in that order okay i would have had a little bit of trouble keeping track you know otherwise okay. but yeah and it makes sense the prosecution's expert witness yeah. said antisocial his doctor that he had been seeing said, no, this is, well, this is what I diagnosed right. him with previously. And of course, the defense is going to have an expert that's, I mean, I hate to say that. No, it but makes like, sense. That's what we do in legal proceedings is, right. you know, each side presents an expert that is going to, of course, typically mm -hmm. give, not always, but typically give something close or exactly what you want they need to yeah. prove their case well and let's that's a great segue so yeah so there you go uh dr sprague who is the defense's expert mm -hmm. did in fact uphold the diagnosis of autism adhd and major depressive disorder he explains that no single diagnosis can account for the murder, but the combination of the three, plus the racing intrusive thoughts from the lack of medication and isolation from the pandemic, contributed to Brian's fixation on violence, which set the stage for a psycho like a psychosis episode leading up to the murder. Dr. Sprague says that a psycho psychotic episode needs only one trigger, and that trigger was Warren Barnes. He, of course, says that Brian Cokie Jr. was not legally sane at the time of the murder. During the prosecution's cross-examination, Assistant District Attorney <laughs> Trish Mare points out that Dr. Sprague is not board certified in forensic psychology, is not appointed by the court, was not qualified to conduct the sane evaluation, never provided his assessment notes to the state doctors, did not record Cokie's interview on video, his opinion nor his practice was peer-reviewed. He also said that family doctor never supported the Dr. Sprague's ideals that uh, Brian had suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts, or delusions. And um, Dr. Sprague evaluated Brian in October 2021, and his final opinion was not submitted for 13 months after his evaluation. 
Trish also said that he was appointed by the defense team and was paid $20,000 for his services. Holy crap. I thought there was a cap on what expert. There's a cap on what the court will pay. Yeah. If you're, coin, if you're court appointed. That's something. So like you said, you get what you pay for. Like mm. when it comes to experts sometimes. I'm not saying that they paid for him to have that opinion because that would be perjury and I would never accuse somebody of perjury. Well, no, but you're going, like I said, you're going to look for somebody that's willing to use what credentials they have to say right what is going to support your case. Yep. So the jury finds Brian guilty of murder in the first degree with two counts of tampering with a deceased human body, tampering with physical evidence. Terry Cokey says, walking out of the courtroom, I would just like to express our family's deep and sincere apologies to the community and family of Mr. Barnes. Judge Richard Gurley said that after 37 years serving different capacities in the court system, including 16 years as a judge, that this was one of the most horrifying cases he's ever experienced. He was sentenced to the rest of his natural life in prison, plus 13 and a half years without parole. Terrifying case. And this wasn't that long ago, so 2021. who knows about appeals, but I highly doubt appeals are going to go anywhere. Yeah, I don't really think so. He was just sentenced last year, like the trial just finished up um, yeah. last year. That's wild. It's fascinating, though, about... The whole psychosis, no psychosis. Yeah, all the different antisocial having different opinions was definitely interesting. I'm on the fence there in what sounds most plausible. Like, on one hand, psychosis, but on the other hand, would he really have had enough? Right. So the, the prosecution uses the fact that he was able to keep a steady job. He had been planning mm -hmm. this for six to 12 months. Exactly. He knew not like to hide the evidence and to try and come yes. up with a plan. And like all of this, you know, goes to show he knew the difference between right and wrong at the time of the crime. And that is really what we're talking about here. Yeah. And when you're having a psychotic episode, you're usually hallucinating. You're not aware. I don't think he could have planned it like that and done no, all of right. that if he was like actually in psychosis. Right. So, ew, wow. But I do believe that he could have antisocial. I could see that. I don't know that much about major depressive disorder, so I don't feel qualified to say one way or the other. Well, I mean, this is a very generalized statement, and it does not mean that everybody with a personality disorder of some kind is, like, violent or capable of such things. But, like, if, if you had no other facts and you said, like, who's more likely to kill somebody, somebody with this personality disorder versus somebody with a depressive disorder, I'm going to be, like, probably the antisocial personality <laughs> disorder. Um, I don't know. Because depression doesn't, I don't know. I'm not an expert. <laughs> I don't know either. I just play one on a podcast. I'm not an expert. <laughs> I just play one on TV. I just play one on a podcast. Um, I'm not sure, but two things. I would like people to start using the names of bodies of water instead of just saying the <laughs> boat ramp because then I look like an idiot when I get on the podcast and realize I never looked up what the body of water was called. <laughs> and number two, if you made it this far in the episode, <laughs> leave us a book emoji for Warren who was so loved yeah. by his community and just genuinely seemed like a really kind soul. And, you know, he had he had people and they loved him. And and the final thing I want to say about that is construction company. Why were you not paying more than enough that he? I don't know. Could live in a place. I don't know. How about that? I don't you know. You want me to get on another soapbox? No, I, I'm just I want you to get off. <laughs> Alicia, get down. <laughs> Um, no, I, listen, 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 Linda, listen, Linda, <laughs> listen, Linda, I don't know Warren's finances or his spending habits. Okay. Yeah. Maybe he spent it all on books. Be careful. I don't know. That's a dangerous hobby. I should know. Yes. That's yeah. why I said that. <laughs> yeah. Careful. But yes, he loved to read and he loved to watch out for the people that he cared about. So please leave us a book emoji in honor of Warren. Yes. If you do so, you will be included in Sunday shoutouts. 
Woohoo. <laughs> Woohoo. That's it. That's it. That's all she got. That's all I wrote. <laughs> well, you did great. Thank you. Except maybe that Lake River okay. pond. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Listen kidding. here, and also, kidding. and also, can we please start like make sure we have the first names of doctors? <laughs> well, we like collectively, collectively, we don't do research together. <laughs> collectively, as a unit, when we're writing articles, oh, yeah, because this, like, the I couldn't find court documents for this. It's, a, it's not old enough to be like yes. readily available, and B, I don't have Colorado credentials, so I couldn't log in and like get yeah. them from the system. And they weren't. I I looked. I looked everywhere. Could not find the court documents. So it wasn't like I could just find it. I was going off of. There was a lovely little local publication, mm-hmm. and some of the articles did not have first names in them. And if they did, I missed them, and I'm sorry. Okay. So really, what you're telling me is, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm deflecting. <laughs> okay, got it. All right. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Thank you. And we'll see you guys next week. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.